Good evening. Um, welcome to the Walter Reed Theatre. Um, you're in for a really amazing experience with this film. My name's Gavin Smith. Uh, I'm one of the members of the selection committee for new directors, uh, and I'm I'm really happy to be here introducing this film and uh, having a conversation with the director afterwards because this is really an extraordinary debut. Um, a film that I saw at the last minute at the Rotterdam Film Festival just days before we locked the program. Um, I, I rushed up to the director and, and he gave me a, a DVD and got back, uh, f flew over to New York, had it distributed to everybody else on the committee and everybody loved it. It's a film that, that's a unanimous decision and I couldn't be happier. Um, okay, enough babbling from me. Please give a warm welcome to a name that I think you're going to be hearing about again um, very soon, uh, Kleber Mendonca Fio. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, thank you so much. I, I really feel lucky uh, to have the film screened here at the New Directors New Films. The film is still very young. Uh, it's screened for the first time in January, in, in uh, actually early February in Rotterdam. And uh, yeah, I'd love to talk about the film afterwards. Uh, it's a very personal film and I hope you have a great screening. Thank you very much. So please welcome back the director, writer, director of Neighboring Sounds, Kleber Mendoza Fio, and his producer, Emily Lusco. <laughs> Lusco, I think. wait for Emily to arrive, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of start the discussion. Um, um, to me, this is a film that's about a society that's uh, haunted by the present, by, by, by a sense of, of, of threats all around, um, but also a society that's haunted by its past. So it's a very haunted society. <laughs> um, that's that's how I how I take the film. That's what I take the film to be about. Um, but can you talk about how you how you developed this project? What your ins inspiration was? What the first notion was that, that led to this film? I think the earliest memory I have in terms of thinking about the the whole concept for the film came from ten or eleven years ago. I worked for a big company in. Uh, which I, I will not give the name in Recife, and uh, it's a modern company, and we had a modern office with computers and all the technology. But there was a certain atmosphere at the workplace that we we lived, we worked for uh, some kind of, um, th that we worked in a sugar plantation. That was the main mindset of working in that company. And this is not really an original idea, it's something that, um, it's very often discussed and, and talked about in Recife, Pernambuco, because I think we have, um, we carry the, this, the it's like the gene of, uh, of uh, Senhor de Engenho, which is the, the master of the, of uh, sugarcane plantations, and uh, which has been historically uh, um, the, the big uh, product of Pernambuco, the state where I come from. Sugarcane has been for decades uh, the only uh, product to come out of Pernambuco, this monoculture of uh, sugarcane. And a lot of that mindset is reflected in the way uh, we live our lives, you know, the way we relate to people at in the workplace. And there is a certain mentality which is very traditional and very uh, strong. And, and I think that's the earliest memory I have towards uh, writing this film. So of course the idea of making a film in a big city but in a street but which had the same kind of um, 
system that you would maybe identify with uh, a sugarcane plantation or an engine, like they call it, that really seemed to be interesting to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how it translates here, but uh, so we haven't screened the film in Brazil yet, but some Brazilian friends uh, who did not really, uh, they were not really part of the process, but when they saw it, they, they, they identified it, and I was, uh, I was happy that that came through in a way. This, this whole, uh, the ethics somehow came through. So you're saying in a sense that, the, that this street uh, is kind of a microcosm in a certain way of, of, a, of a whole kind of system, of a, a whole social system based around the, the kind of plata the plantation culture? Well, uh, it is in a way, but it's, uh, Pernambuco is a, is a very peculiar, culture, if you think in terms of Brazil and the so we have so many different states and so many different cultures and accents. And Pernambuco historically is, is a very interesting uh, state if you look at it from, you know, in terms of history. And it's really tough to discuss this here uh, because it's really a feeling, it's, it's really something that I feel and that Maybe a lot of people share that same feeling, uh, and, and I only try to translate that and make a film out of that feeling. But it's it's tough to discuss it because um, it's there, it's real, but I I'm not sure it's it's being officialized in any in any way. I don't think there is a book uh, that discusses it in a in a personal level. And this is what I really try to do with the film. I'm not sure I mean well, making I mean myself clear, but not not being well versed in in either Brazilian cin cinema or Brazilian culture, I can say that 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 I felt very caught up in in what was going on immediately, and I think that the the, the film builds a certain tension very steadily and slowly, so that any of the, any of the cultural specifics that, that that I might not have picked up on didn't really matter. I felt like it completely transcended any of those cultural aspects. Um, so, so what you're saying is, is news to me, but it doesn't make me feel like I didn't understand the film. Well, wha um, what you're saying also, I, I, I th fear is universal. I mean, we all, you know, it's part of our lives in modern society. But Brazil does have a history of violence. And... Uh, I always say it's perfectly possible to be happy, uh, you know, to lead a very happy life in Brazil. It's a fantastic country, a fascinating place. But there is a certain culture of violence, uh, which e even if you're not yourself a victim of violence, you feel a certain, f uh, f a constant fear of violence. And this is very much present in life in the big si Brazilian cities. Uh, Hisif is definitely one of them. I have, myself, I have never been a victim of violence in Brazil. Uh, uh, but the effects of this culture of violence, or this, this culture of fear of violence, uh, they manifest themselves in the way we live. Uh, and, and I think that photographs really well. <laughs> That that notion of, of of a kind of a privileged class that that lives in kind of fear of an underclass and, and lives in fear of the violence that that potentially can erupt, I think though is becoming um, more widespread. I think it's yeah. it's no longer a Brazilian problem. I think it's a, it's it's becoming an issue with gated communities in America and 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 all over Europe. I mean, it is becoming more about the modern condition than just the Brazilian condition. Yeah, I'm married to Emily, she's French, and uh, we have this uh, double life in France and Brazil, and uh, of course they're very different countries and societies, but yes, there is something also in Europe going on uh, right now, which, yeah, and, and last week uh, the film will be sh screened in Copenhagen next, uh, next month, and the festival 
CPH picks uh, produced uh, an introduction to the film, and th the film is still very young, so I'm still learning from, you know, from you, from, y you know, stuff that comes out in the press, and makes interesting observations about the film, and and this pres uh, introduction from the Dan from the Danes. Uh, they uh, they said it was a uh, what the film is trying to show is very much universal. Unfortunately, that's how they end. Unfortunately, and yeah. To get to get into some more specific things, I'm curious about um, the way in which you counterpoint the the, the family of Schwal and the, uh, you know, the the three generations, and uh, and and the family of Bia who doesn't really seem to have any, there's no real contact, point of contact between these two families, except that they happen to live in, on the same street. And I'm interested in what you were trying to get, get at through the kind of counterpointing of those two families. Um, I think Bia's family uh, has really no relation to the other story, but they do uh, because they live in the same community and, and I think they are part of the same mindset in a way which uh, makes them part of the whole process and the whole panorama. Um, I also wanted to work with that character because I had done a previous, uh, it's a short film called Electrodomestica. It's in, it was done in, uh, in 2005. And uh, I really liked that character. I, I liked this lonely woman who has this great relationship with her kids and uh, and she's like a little bird in a cage and uh, but you know I it's not like a miserable life it's just a life you know a life that takes place on a Tuesday morning you know nothing special nothing fantastic is happening in her life and I wanted to bring that to the film and and I think it's part of this uh, it's like a cinemascope uh, panorama which if it didn't work, it would feel very uh, pretentious, and hopefully it doesn't feel like that. It just feels natural that we're looking at her life, and sometimes like an observer, and sometimes like we are living with her. I mean, the uh, sense I had of, of, of the function of that sort of subplot to the, to the main plot was that their family seems to be a, a family that's not carrying any baggage. It seems like a family that's, that's a modern family that's looking to the future. They're learning Chinese, they're learning English. I agree, yes. And the other family is somehow stuck in some weird place that they're never really going to get out of. Um, and that's why it seems to me, that, I mean, I'm curious about what seems to be the main character with Xiao, but he's a very inactive main character. Uh, I'm curious about that. Yeah, I, I agree with that because um, the way I see families in Hasifa today, I think there are tr the traditional families who come from old sugarcane money. And these are very specific. Y you understand their rituals. You almost know what their rituals will be if you visit, if you, if you uh, visit their house or, you know, if you're with them. And then there are other families who are more, it's more like uh, recent money you know, they, they don't really seem to have a lot of tradition. And, uh, and I think you're right, that, that would apply to Bia's family. Uh, the whole Mandarin thing, it really comes from the fact that Pernambuco right now is, there's a lot of money coming in Pernambuco and there's a new uh, port which is bringing a lot of investment. And yes, people are learning Chinese and Mandarin. T could you talk a little bit about about the setting of Recife? Uh, uh, it's not a city that I that I've heard of. I mean, I think when people think of Brazil, they think of Sao Paulo and they think of um, maybe the capital city, uh, but uh, uh, or, or they think of Rio. But I've never heard of this of, of this of this city, and it seems to be a major you know a major city, just as just as big as the others. Well, yeah, it's the fifth largest. Sometimes it's listed as the fourth, sometimes it's the sixth. I, I never really know. Uh, yeah, it's... I mean, what I'm saying is, does it have its own particular character? I mean, you've, very chose much you've very chosen to set the film there. Very much so, but I, I, I chose to set the film there because I come from Recife. It would be very uh, organic for me to make a film there. 
Um, and right now, I think Recife has a very hot, very interesting film scene, um, also a music scene, which is really strong. And, um, and there is also um, a lot of investment in filmmaking uh, from the local government. But I basically, I, I shot the film on the street where I live, so it was, uh, it was never a choice between Recife or any other city, because I, that's where I come from. Um, also, I think in Brazil, if, you're, if you come from Recife or Salvador or Fortaleza, it really means that you're watching, all the images you're watching on television, they come from Rio and Sao Paulo. So there is this, you know, Rio and Sao Paulo, they blanket the whole country with their own images and novellas and, um, you know, production is not really widespread uh, throughout the country, except now and for the last five, six, seven years with films. But the films that come out of Recife, they're not uh, big box office films. They're very kind of personal they're, they're films. They're independent films. Very independent and very personal films, which get shown in big international film festivals, but they don't really make, uh, make waves in terms of uh, big box office uh, you know, product. That still comes from the global style uh, comedies that get shown in multiplexes. And, and yeah, again, it's not something that I thought about. I just made the film because I come from Recife, but I think it's great that we get to, you know, show that we have our own accent. And there are other places in Brazil other than Rio and right. Sao Paulo, yeah. Um, question for, for uh, Emily. Um, it's an independent film and it's probably a small budgeted film, but, but the film has a tremendous scope to it. There are, there, there are, it you, you get the sense of, of, of a scale that's much larger than, than um, perhaps the budget was. Uh, I'm curious as to how, you've, um, how you approach the production. Um, uh, you talk about the, you know, how, y how you put this together. Yeah, it's a rather low budget uh, for Brazil. Um, and I think the, the challenge for us was uh, that we had to deal with many, many actors and uh, many different locations. Uh, I don't know, uh, 20 or 30 houses and apartments. So um, uh, that, that was the main challenge in terms of budget and we had to uh, count on the uh, goodwill of many friends and, <laughs> and uh, people we knew. Is this the first feature you've produced? Yeah. Yes, we produced a, a, a feature documentary as well, but uh, but it's the first feature. Yes. It's just that in terms of amb uh, of the ambition of the film and the reach of the film, it just seems so much more, um, so much bigger than the average independent film from from anywhere. Um. Yeah, and we also invested in um, um, the, uh, the, the look of the film. The, the 35 millimeters was important for us because we didn't have that much money uh, in terms of art direction, but it had to look good. And every time you get a, if you keep shooting wide in a low budget film, you'll give people the wrong idea about how much it costs if you shoot really wide all the time. Because I don't know, for some strange reason, very cheap independent films always shoot like this, you, know, you can see somebody's nose or, and I, it, it doesn't cost anything to open up the, the plane. <laughs> and uh, we, we really uh, went for this uh, wide, not only wide screen in terms of the, the ratio, but keeping it wide because I wanted to show people in their environment. And that, it for some strange reason, makes the whole thing look more expensive. And I learned that from John Carpenter, which is a, he's a director I loved, an American director. It's a great lesson, though. Uh, <laughs> people have forgotten that one. So <laughs> maybe, maybe, um, maybe you should go back to the John Carpenter films. Okay, I'm going to take questions from out there, because there are loads. Yeah. Feral Boy, I love that. Uh, 
There's a question about the kind of w the backbone of the uncanny that seems to to be to to run through the film and, and certain moments, for instance, uh, specifically the the boy in the tree. Uh, were they integral from the beginning um, when you were conceiving the film, or was that a kind of a, a layer that, that that kind of you know surfaced um, subsequently? Well, I love uh, urban legends, and I've done two short films, uh, which in fact you can see on the internet on Vimeo. Uh, one comes from a local urban legend, which is The Little Cotton Girl, and the second is Green Vinyl, which is from a Ukrainian uh, fairy tale urban legend. It's called Green Vinyl. But for this film, there was another local urban legend which in fact came from a real story. Uh, it's the story of Spider Boy. Spider Boy was a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old, 18 year old, and then he got shot by the police. He, he was, sh well, I'm sorry, he was not shot by the police. He was shot by nobody knows who, 14 times. And he died like uh, 300 meters from where we live, in the same neighborhood where we shot the film. And uh, Spider Boy used to climb uh, high rises using the the cables for the cell cell phone antennas, which some high rises uh, rent, you know, the, the the top of the building for these antennas. And he would just uh, go into the the very expensive apartments, and he would eat, uh, and then he would just fall asleep and he would be picked up by the police in early in the morning because somebody found this kid sleeping in, his in, in their uh, living room or kitchen. Uh, and then he died, of course, and he would always get arrested and escape from this uh, institution. And so that where that's where it comes from, Spider Boy. And the idea of this kid, nobody, N nobody can actually say that he was har he harmed anyone. He was just like a uh, worst case scenario. He was a thief, but mostly he, he basically he was found sleeping in in so many houses, and uh, so that that's where it com that's where it comes from, Spider Boy. But the overall kind of feeling of something almost supernatural that that's maybe related to the kind of fear theme. Um, was that something you were actively working for? Is that just yeah, inherent in the material? That's a really good question because uh, I th when I set out to write the script and I told myself, I'm, I, yeah, I'm going to write a script uh, for a feature. I thought that I was going for a, rea a very realistic film, but during the process I discovered that I wasn't really interested in making a 100% realistic film because it would be boring. Uh, so naturally I began to drift towards these strange moments which I hope, I hope they, they feel interesting and not something that was designed or, uh, almost mathematically, which they were not. They actually come from uh, experiences that I have read about or gone lived through you know and, and they just found you themselves some other instances in the film in particular uh, well the the story of the of the somebody who died in a building and and those the, the flower wreaths the, is that the, is that the word in english uh, i saw one of those in a building and i thought it was really kind of heavy you know seeing uh, this these flowers brought by friends or whoever and for somebody that had, had committed suicide uh, three days before. And yeah, that would look really strange in the film. And that's real and two people in Rotterdam said, but that was made up, right? No, I, I did see flower wreaths uh, on the ground floor in one of these high rises. Well so that those kinds, of de those kinds of details, they hopefully they work in you know, to give this certain heightened uh, atmosphere. Well, they do, but in, in another way, they break the pattern, and so in a way, th it makes the film even more believable because it's it's not neatly kind of laid out. Um, sure. Yes.
There's a question about the musicality of the film, not just the music and the score, but, but the, uh, the use of sound in a musical way. And I, I would add, I'm particularly curious about that boing sound, the, the, the very low bass note that, uh, that uh, periodically crops up. Well, thank you, and thank you for the... Uh, I love traditional scores in cinema. You know, if you go back to the throughout the history of cinema, we have, you know, we all know fantastic uh, examples of Bernard Herrmann, and I don't have to say more. But uh, for this film, I didn't think uh, the film, uh, I didn't think I needed this, uh, some kind of a traditional score for this film because I thought that I could get away maybe with a kind of um, uh, it's what I call a, a sonic carpet for the whole film and, 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 and I would use sound effects and noises uh, and if it was done correctly no one would really notice that oh now he's for example I think that the most obvious example is the nightmare sequence with the little girl um, I could have gone for a string sec section, you know, with violins and cellos and, uh, you know, typical uh, horror film stuff. But we just use the, the, the sound effects from the invasion and keep, we, we just kept making them louder. And at some point, uh, the mix, one of the mixers said, but are you, it doesn't make sense because now we are inside and it's getting loud. Yeah, but forget it because I just needed to make I just need to make it louder and louder and louder, even if it's not realistic. So that was one uh, idea. About the Hisifi sound, Hisifi, like I said before, yes, has a very strong uh, music scene. And I love the work of Shiko Science. You know, I, I, he was a wonderful, wonderful uh, person and artist. He died in 1996, 1997. Um, but I, again, I didn't want to go, you know, the typical Hesifi sound with Maracatu and everything else because uh, Maracatu is very powerful. It's, it's amazing, but I, again, I didn't think it would be right for this film. Um, I thought that in some, at some point, uh, Bia would be at home listening to Queen or Georgie Bain, which is like a very personal selection uh, which comes out of nowhere, but it doesn't. It comes probably from her iPod or her, uh, or, and you, you, asked, you also asked about the, that low frequency yeah, thing. The just this note that, that's held. Um, it, yeah, I mean, it, it's just one of those things. Uh, I worked with uh, DJ Dolores, he's a, he's a, he's very talented, uh, gifted artist, and he's a good friend. And I told him, I want to work with you, but I want something that would be more than noise and less than music. What can you do for me? <laughs> <laughs> and then he sent me an email with this boom, and I go, really? <laughs> <laughs> this is how... I mean, you can't get any more simple, any simpler than that. And I, I just added to the, the opening sequence, and I called him and I said, it's amazing, but it's nothing, but it works. I mean, it's almost nothing, and that's the genius of it. It's almost nothing, but it is something, and it seemed to work. And I began to show it to friends, and I said, wow, this, that's really interesting. What is it? It's a boing. That, that's what it is. It is what it is. But it seems to work, and, yeah, and, and I was very happy with it. It sounds like a cons construction noise that we, we hear all the time. Yeah. Well, because uh, in our neighborhood, we get these, um, what do you call in English? The pile drivers. Pile drivers, exactly. All the time. It is amazing. It, you really get a sense y from listening to this, to his sifio, to the neighborhood, you really get a sense that there is money coming in. Because uh, you know, uh, in a way, I remember I, it was it reminded me of the the films of Jia Zhangke, um, Chinese director. Uh, I think a lot of his films uh, have to do with this thing in China, you know, construction and work and construction, and uh, so maybe there is a parallel there. More questions. 
uh, all the way in the back. There's a question about um, the children in the film and how they seem to be sort of exempt from this kind of pervasive fear and how uh, I mean there's a whole range of children. Um, how, how did you work with them to kind of to create that? To create that? Um, you, you said that they seem to be exempt from the whole process? Well, I, I, thank you for the question, but I'm not sure I agree because I think they're innocent, which is always beautiful, and the children are fantastic, and I love to have them in the film. But if you really look into each of those kids, they are being introduced to the whole process, I think. Uh, the little kid with the football, I mean, he, all kinds of bad things happen to him. He, in terms of urban space, he, he's not allowed to play. And of course, when we are kids, uh, we always find a way to play. And, and he does find a way to play football. He goes back home and plays video game football. Um, I think the little girl, uh, she, through her nightmare, we sense that uh, things might not be uh, so easy and uh, um, I did think about that during the you know the writing process uh, that the kids would be kids but in a way I mean and look at the the kid with the video camera in the who shoots the the footage for the for the night guy the the watchman uh, in the building uh, he's also being introduced by and I and I see that a lot, you know. Uh, yeah, it's kids uh, from the opening, they also play in a playground that exactly. yeah. looks like a jail. <laughs> yeah, the opening sequence, it's almost like jailhouse rock. I mean, it's they're in a they're in a federal prison, uh, and it's uh, you know the time when the inmates uh, go out to to get some sunshine. And, and I see that every day in, in our neighborhood. You know, you have this platoon of uh, maids and nannies, uh, uniformed nannies, uh, uh, taking care of these rich kids. So, I, 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 yeah, I try to include children into the process without maybe sounding, you know, preachy, but it is what it is. So in a way, I, I, I think I disagree. Uh, I see their innocence, but I also see that they're being introduced to the whole thing. Yes. Yeah, the question about the sequence in the film where they travel to the countryside to the presumably the old plantation and there's a deserted, there's an abandoned movie theater and what was th um, what was the intention behind that sequence? It felt like traveling into the past. Well, when I was writing the script and I had reached that point and I wrote the script very fast because I, there was a deadline for for the Ministry of Culture, which I I wanted I I had to meet. Uh, but when I got to that point in the script, I just felt like leaving that street. I couldn't, I, I just felt that it would be desirable uh, for the film to leave that uh, street. And uh, I could have gone to Mars or, I don't know, to Australia, but I decided to go uh, to, it's about 80 kilometers from Recife, which is... Um, 
the sugar plantation area was is located uh, no more than 100 kilometers west of his city, uh, inland. And, and that's where all the, the, the plantations were and still are what remains of them. And it, and it is natural because I know families who spend their weekends in their old, uh, it's like going back to feudalism, you know, it's only uh, an hour from Recife, but you're back in late 19th century in many ways. Um, and also the, the film theater, the, the, the cinema, uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm, I have a sweet spot for uh, old cinemas. I just love them. I, it's something that I, I'm fascinated by them. I, I wh and whenever I travel, I visit old cinemas or what's left of them. Um, but at the same time, it, it's uh, one of these, uh, these plantations, they were like a very small town with a school, a post office, a cinema, of course, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And the last remaining ones closed, shut down in the 70s. So most of the buildings are still there and they are like ghosts from the past, like film theaters or cinemas usually are when you visit them and they're abandoned. They are like ghosts, fantastic places from the past and you can almost see people lining up. You know, it's a personal thing of mine. I just love them. And uh, yeah, I had to shoot in that cinema. It was so natural and it was there. It's a fantastic location. And I, it's, w it's probably my personal, my favorite moment in the whole film when they visit the film. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yes. Um, further back, yes. You're asking me what happened or why 1984 in the film? I'm not sure I should tell you this. Uh, now, really, I, I, I'm not trying to be funny. It's just um, I'm... I really have a problem when I, I have to explain something in the film and, and that sequence is actually very mysterious and very suggestive. And uh, um, something very serious happened in 1984. In Rotterdam, somebody asked me why 1984 and the only reason I could come up with is, is I was as old as the two brothers or at least the, the older brother or closer to the older brother in 1984 and it's a date it's a year that I, I remember very well from my early teens. Um, but of course, there was another interpretation in Rotterdam, which had to do with the end of the military regime in Brazil. And I love that interpretation, but I have to admit that I, it, I didn't think about that. Uh, but I, I accepted you it. Consciously didn't. I'm sorry? Not consciously. Probably, yeah. It, it was, in fact, the last year of military dictatorship because the following year there was the Direta Ja movement which uh, when uh, the people demanded uh, democratic elections for president which finally happened in 1989. So yes, it is a very interesting year but uh, I, I really should apologize to you uh, for not really explaining because uh, I tried my best to make that sequence clear but not in a very obvious way and, and I'd rather not really tell you exactly what happened. I'm sorry. Yes.
it's really tough to discuss references and, and in fact I usually avoid it because uh, <laughs> right but uh, the thing with references that is that um, when you drop a name like that John Carpenter uh, it's the association which you can make as a viewer tends to be I'm not saying it is in your case but tends to be very easy but the way it works in our minds when we're making a film, it's really much more complex. It's not, I, I don't think it's all about the, the, fi the physicality of the film. Uh, you mentioned the, the invasion, for example, which is easily associated with Assault on Precinct 13, which in fact is a film that I love. Uh, but I think it has really to do with a general atmosphere, a general feeling, um, the way you frame, the way you uh, you find the pace for the film and the whole, uh, you know, the general climate of the picture, you know. In my mind, for some reason, when I was writing the script, I could only think of John Carpenter. But that is probably a personal uh, trip that I had and, and hopefully somebody will see the film and, I don't know, make uh, interesting associations. But it doesn't really mean that I am... Uh, I was held hostage by John Carpenter while I was making the film. You know, I, I I just made the film, and it has so many other references coming into it. Like I don't know Eduardo Coutinho, which is a uh, a great filmmaker from Brazil, and there is some of him uh, in this film, uh, especially from a fantastic film that he made in 1984. 1984 again. Uh, Cabra Marcado para Morrer, which is, I think it's 20 years later in here in, uh, in the US. And, uh, but yeah, there are so many other references. Uh, and John Carpenter for me is one of them because I just love his films. Uh, I've, I loved his, I've loved his films for, since 1983 when I saw, his f the first film I saw of him was 1983. And uh, so it's really tough to discuss these specific references. Yes. Um, it's a difficult question to paraphrase, but um, it's a question about. Um, I almost feel like you should say it in 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 Portuguese and 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 then have um, Faber translate it because I I think you're saying that that, that there's a, 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 a an exploration of public and private space in the film, and that there's this the, the, there's an absence of the state by which I mean I think you mean the authorities like police. Um, and then part of your question is also about does Kleber feel that this kind of built-in sort of DNA of, of fear and, and, and violence and fear of violence, is that something that he sees ever coming to an end or is it just going to continue? Is that basically it? I think I do, yeah. Uh, there is a moment in the beginning where with we see a police car, but nothing happens, and they go away. Uh, uh, I, I, f it, I have to say that it attracted me uh, making a film without any kind of uh, official authority, uh, or the state, or the police, or cops coming in, or um, politicians, you know, nothing like that, because in our lives, we don't really have access to those people all the time and I think it's perfectly possible to uh, you know to live your life without having to you know resort to them that's one thing uh, in terms of this DNA of fear I, I'm very pessimistic because um, Hisifi right now 
as I said, there's a lot of money coming in. Brazil is is uh, enjoying this economic uh, boom, and there's a, l a lot of money coming into the state of Pernambuco for many different investments, like I said before. Uh, but in many ways, it feels like uh, the money is being used to build more tower blocks, and they have these four meter high perimeter walls with electric sensors and that's that's the basic idea for our ar architecture uh, for the middle class and the upper middle class so Hisif is really uh, there is no real thinking in terms of how the city should be fought you know should be organized and it's not only Hisif if you go to Belo Horizonte and Brasilia is, is 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 a mess right now Sao Paulo I mean, what can I say? Sao Paulo is, is what we all should avoid in terms of, uh, of, wha of, of what the big cities are moving towards, you know. Um, so in, in that sense, I don't really see, I, I, I can only see the, this mentality feeding the same mentality in the near future. I don't really, I, I, I'm not very uh, optimistic in, in that sense because I think architecture really dictates how we live and it really reflects how we think. Not, I'm not putting. My, I'm, I'm not including myself in this, but in terms of society. And uh, and of course, we get to travel a lot, and we have access to other, you know, countries. And when I visit them, I, I just see that things are more uh, different. And 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 I think Brazil. Uh, and this is one thing that I wanted to put in the film. This, this, uh, it, it, it's like a bad architecture again photographs really well but it's r it really sucks in terms of how i mean we feel like a uh, little mice uh, and uh, i I'm, I'm not very optimistic in that in that sense uh time for maybe one last question if there is one is there one no i think we're done okay well thanks everyone for coming thank you thanks so much to Emily thank you gavin Pippa.